everyone. Welcome to the Center for Fiction. My name is Melanie McNair. I'm the Senior Director of Public Programming here. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we're the only literary nonprofit that focuses on the creation and enjoyment of fiction. How many of you are visiting us for the first time this evening? Oh, so most of you are like, cool. <laughs> well, welcome. Um, so you know, if you live in New York City, uh, we have a member floor upstairs and we're doing a membership drive this month, so it's a lot less expensive. So check it out, there's membership brochures on your seats. Um, basically, it's an extremely beautiful place to read and write and there's a terrace and you can check out library books and you get discounts on everything we do, which is a lot. So uh, check us out. Um, also, welcome to those of you who are joining us tonight via live stream. Uh, after the talk tonight, we will have an audience Q&A. And if you're here, please raise your hand. And one of our fabulous interns will bring a microphone to you. Make sure you speak into the microphone so that the people who are watching via the live stream can hear you. And um, if you're on the live stream, just type your question in the chat. Um, let's see. That is all I need to tell you, except that we'll, the authors were kind enough to pre-sign their books, and they will be doing personalization afterward. And the books are all at the bookstore counter. All right, let me introduce our guest. David Means was born and raised in Michigan. He's the author of five short story collections, including Two Nurses Smoking, Instructions for a Funeral, The Spot, a New York Times notable, notable book of the year, Assorted Fire Events, and The Secret Goldfish, and the novel Histopia, which was long listed for the Man Booker Prize. His stories have appeared everywhere a good story should, and he teaches at Vassar College. Rebecca Miller is the author of the short story collection Personal Velocity, her feature film adaptation of which won the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. The Private Lives of Pippa Lee, which she also adapted for the screen, Jacob's Folly, and most recently, the story collection Total. Her other films include Angela, The Ballad of Jack and Rose, and Maggie's Plan. And Sadiq Fofana earned an MFA from the New York University and was an emerging writer fellow at the Center for Fiction. So this is a homecoming for him and we're very proud of him. He lives with his wife and son in New York City where he is a public school teacher. Stories from the Tenant Downstairs is his debut publication. And uh, we're all happy to celebrate with him. And to moderate this evening, we have the fabulous Idra Novi, the award-winning author of the novels Ways to Disappear and Those Who Knew. Her work has been translated into a dozen languages, and she's written for the Atlantic, New York Times, and the Los Angeles Times. She teaches fiction at Princeton and the MFA program at New York University. Her new novel, Take What You Need, is coming in 2023. Please welcome them all to the stage. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I, it's such an honor to talk about these superb three collections of fiction. And we thought we would start with each of them reading five or seven minutes so you can hear the stories before we talk about them. So Sadiq, okay. do you want to start us off? All right. So this will probably, it's going to be um, less than two minutes. I'm just, I'm going to read the intro. Um, so the intro goes as follows. Brown brothers, sisters, moms, and brown pairs lived in the building with their neighbors downstairs, trying to stay alive and make all their stars align. Scant money in a ward, the rent on my mind. A nose above the tide trying to stay afloat on the edge, but I hope I won't fold. Instead, be like a pillar about to crumble, but stay concrete. While a man is on my shoulder, all I want is peace. My skin is getting scaly and my boss is trying to rail me. I, I go to work daily saying feet don't yet fill me. Relationships, friendships, and 99 attacks on my character, bills, and I'm black. You see my hurt grin. You see my makeup. You see the stub from my job. You see the rainbow pop up in my scars. Everybody got a story. Everybody got a tale. Question is, is it despair or prevail? <laughs> So 
this working? Yes. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from the opening story for my book called Clementine Carmelita Dog. Um, I had a dachshund for about 14, 13 years, and um, I, well, I got to know my dog really, I, I don't even want to start, but, um, <laughs> uh, so I finally decided to try to write a, a dog story, knowing that maybe it was kind of a cliche to write a dog story, but I, I did it anyway, and this is the beginning. A middle-aged dachshund with a short hair, caramel-colored coat scurried along a path, nervously veering from one side to the other, stopping to lower her nose to the ground to catch traces of human footwear, a whiff of rubber, an even fainter residue of shoe leather, smells that had formed a vague pattern of hikers in the past. Some had probably walked through that part of the woods long ago. She lifted her nose and let it flare to catch the wind from the north and in it she detected the familiar scent of river water after it had passed through trees and over rock, a delightful and, under other circumstances, soothing smell that in the past had arrived in the house when her person, Norman, opened the windows. The wind was stirring the trees, modeling the sunlight, and she tweezed it apart to find his scent, or even her own scent, which she'd lost track of in her burst of freedom. But all she caught was a raccoon she knew and a whiff of bacon frying in some faraway kitchen. So she put her nose down and continued north again, following an even narrower path, invisible to the human eye, into thick weeds and brush, picking up burrs as she moved into the shadows of the cliff to her left until the ground became hard and rocky. Then she paused for a moment and lifted her head and twitched her ears to listen for a whistle or the sound of her own name Clementine in Norman's distinctive pitch. All she heard was the rustle of leaves, the call of birds. How had she gotten into this predicament, her belly low to the ground lost in the forest? That morning, Norman had jiggled the leash over her head, a delightful sound, and asked her if she wanted to go for a walk, as if she needed to be asked, and looked down as she danced and wagged and rushed to the back door to scratch and bark. At the door, she had sniffed at the crack where the outside air slipped in, and as she had so many times before, caught the smell that would never leave the house, the mix of patchouli and ginger that was Claire. She was still Claire's dog. In the scent was a memory of being lifted into arms and nuzzled and kissed, the waxy lipstick, and then other memories of being on the floor rolling around, and then the stark, earthy smell that she noticed one day near Claire, Claire's armpit, a scent she knew from an old friend, a lumbering gray-furred beast who was often tied up outside the coffee shop in town. It was the smell of death. Claire got that smell seeping up through her skin. It became stronger and appeared in other places until she began sleeping downstairs in the living room in a bed that moaned loudly when it moved. And there were days on that bed sleeping in the sun at her feet or in her arms, and then in the strange way of humans, she disappeared completely. That's as far as I'm going to go. So um, when I was, I tried to write this story many, many times over a long, many, many years. And there was an assault in the center of the story and I was trying to, I just had the assault and no story. So this character kind of was born in her angry little self um, somewhere in the last 20 years. She got, she, she, she ferreted her way through. And um, so here's the beginning of that story. It's called um, Receipts. My mother always said there are no atheists on turbulent flights. This was not her line. It was the first line in Erica Jong's smash hit 1973 novel, Fear of Flying. A writer in the New York Times said 40 years later that, quote, what most people remember about the novel is the provocative expression Ms. Jong invented to encapsulate Isadora Wing's fantasy, the first word of which is zipless, the second word of which cannot be printed even today in this newspaper. 
I, however, can freely tell you the second word is fuck. Isadora <laughs> Wing was searching for the zipless fuck, sex pure and without trappings. I read this by then yellowing book at the age of 12 in brief installments, sneaking into my mother's chaotic room, thinking I was getting away with something, until she found me and asked, are you old enough to read that? That was typical of her, asking a kid how it should be raised. One thing I particularly remember from before my parents' divorce was, we were at a party at the Henderson's house on a school night and my mother was in her cups. Suzanne could get sexy, disheveled, and sorry for herself of an evening. Later in life, I came to loathe her drunken self, but when I was little, I just didn't want my funny, cutely incompetent mom to vanish, replaced by this other person. On the night of the party, my bedtime had come and gone hours earlier. I got up off the coats where I had been napping and walked into a roar of laughter in the crowded living room. My father, remembering me, looked over at my mother and called out, She should be in bed, Suzanne. My mother glared at him for a fat second before countering, Oh, I'll drive her. You stay here and have fun, Chazzy. I was only nine years old, but I knew it was a bad idea for my mother to drive a car at that moment. I remember holding on to my father's waist and looking up at him. I didn't say she was drunk. It was obvious. I just said, please don't let mom drive me. Dad was in the middle of a conversation and waved away my appeal. It was winter in Kansas City. The moon was bright. I plodded down the Henderson's shovel drive behind my mother, who was taking liberties with a beeline. She swung open the driver's door of our car. I slipped onto the frigid back seat where I figured I had a better chance of surviving a crash. My mother is 10 years younger than Erica Jong. She might seem older by that now, by her, uh, she might seem older than her by now though. Age is so relative and to my mother it has not been kind. Her bloated, waxy body lurks like a termite queen in swathes of fabric as she trudges through her cluttered house in Upper California, cropped hair dyed a puce reserved in the salons, it seems, for 65-year-old women with a great quantity of turquoise budding on their fingers and sweaty strings of it snaked around their necks as if to say, still we rebel, still we are slovenly, still we do not keep our receipts. I personally do keep my receipts. I like to know what I have paid and why. On the day I'm remembering, about 15 years ago, I was in fact on a bumpy flight, the kind of bucking and lurching that makes you feel incredulous that you allowed yourself to get locked into a metal tube connected to absolutely nothing and get hurled through space. The laws of physics are nothing to your basic human need to have Earth under your feet at moments like this, and I can see why people start praying, but not me. I hold on to my atheism and wait. That day, it was a quick flight to Fort Lauderdale from Cincinnati for a medical device conference. I was working for Avista, promoting a new range of asthma inhalers. I had packed in a distracted state. Chad and I had an argument as I did so. I was going to be missing our second anniversary by going to the conference. I could have sent someone junior to me, but frankly, I was looking over my shoulder at the time, one worried I'd be laid off. The company was downsizing. I wanted to weather the shedding of employees, to seem essential. If I could secure purchases of a significant amount of product at this conference, I was looking at a promotion, and Chad and I were hoping to get married. We didn't want children. I had never wanted children. Children led to everything I disliked. Anxiety about money, depletion of free time, inability to enjoy your life. Chad was the youngest of a feckin' six, so there was no pressure on him. My stepsister Gabby, my mother, remarried a couple of times after my dad, had three kids, so Suzanne had checked the grandma box. I was 30 and excited for all this time I had to become a big success and not have kids. I'm so glad you all got to hear a taste of each of these before we talk about them. Um, something I noticed reading these three fantastic collections was how artfully and concisely you each introduce these interior moments, which you know you read in observations that give a reader this immediate sense of a character, because in the world of a story is you know small, and so you have to get an immediate sense of a character, whereas you know 
if you write a novel, you just there's more time to get it in. So you sort of have to make it happen fast. Um, and Rebecca, something I'll, we talked about right before the event, that I, I kept underlining these unexpected metaphors in your stories. Um, and many of them were characters addressing the, how they relate to spiritual divine forces when life spirals out of control. And this character kept referring to her atheism and when she doesn't pray. And in a way, it's sort of, you know, like, so it, there is an investigation of spirituality, even if it's the denial of it, yeah, and it which is really interesting. Uh, and in the Chekhovians, is one of my favorite stories, Laura imagines herself lying in the palm of God like a kind of hammock. So fabulous. And in another story that's nested within a story, there's a woman imagines her violent thoughts like a pride of lions in an empty shopping mall. <laughs> and I was like, are my thoughts? lines? <laughs> it, are they in an airport? You know, anyway, um, so I, it just gave me so much to think about. And I was, if, if this is for, for all of you, was thinking about a character's relationship and your stories to faith or their higher forces or um, lions, um, you know, and how their inner life, you know, is something in, in your formation of a character and how, when that happens, you know, and does it happen differently depending on the character? And were there stories where you attended more to a character's spiritual beliefs or a relationship to denying a spiritual dimension of life um, when, when you were sort of co trying to come up with that sense of character and like the confines of the story? That's, that's my question. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, 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 Rebecca, when you were reading, I noticed that, um, yeah, the, the, I immediately caught on to their, the whole idea of um, her being atheist, and then flying and, and, and having this anxiety but maintaining her atheism. And just that belief and just having her thoughts um, immediately drew me in. And I think when I'm writing, I try to think about, I always, you know, we live in the world of like daily aff affirmations, so like, Writing is very depressing, so, <laughs> so you have to have your affirmations and you have to like remind yourself that you're doing the right thing. And one of my affirmations is like, stories are about people, not about plots. And, and so, um, and somehow I always like disobey it, but, and then like, you know, when I'm rewriting, I come back to that. And so I'm always telling myself that, um, you know, if people are gonna read this, they're most likely gonna be interested in the individual and what they're thinking. And so whenever I run into like um, a block, I always ask myself simple questions like, what does this character like? <laughs> you know, what are their goals? What are their dreams? Um, what do they fear? What do they want others to believe about them? And then I, when I start answering those questions, I find that um, you know characters become a little fuller, and then also like a story sometimes organically comes from that. Sometimes. So. Do you ever think about it like, do they ever pray? Do they it, vehemently choose not to? You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's one character, uh, Miss Dallas. She's a para in a school, yeah. and um, you know her school is a failing school. And this year, the year it comes to one moment when the powers that be are going to enter the school and judge it. And for a while, when the powers that be are in the classroom judging and everyone's fake being a good student, you know, <laughs> she has this thought where she's like, hmm, maybe God just puts us in predicament so that they could just be okay again and, you know, we can just appreciate things. And so she has that moment where she ponders why this is happening and she kind of appeals to maybe a higher power. Um, and so, you know, I'm not gonna lie and tell you that like, oh, I was waiting for that moment for her to talk about God. <laughs> but it just, it just happened. And I think when people have that uh, moment of spirituality, um, you know, it kind of makes them vulnerable and it mm -hmm. gives you insight into their, their personality. Absolutely. It mm -hmm. sometimes feels like entering any school building in this country is a leap of faith. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. David, how about you? Well, I, I just think Mrs. Dallas mm -hmm. is such an enigmatic character. And, you know, um, 
I was thinking about her point of view, how she's not the teacher, she's the parent, whatever, and, and yet we're with her and, and she has this knowingness. Uh, but with me, I, I, one time I was at a literary thing um, in Ireland with some other writer who shall remain nameless, and he was going on and on about character, blah, blah, character. And I was like, um, when it came my turn to speak, I lied and said something like character's meaningless. There's, I said there's not room in a short story to develop character. And I was like, it was one of those statements where I wasn't sure if I really meant it. It, so <laughs> it sounded profound, the whole audience got quiet, I could feel people thinking. But then I, a part of me thinks, you know, like I don't really have room to develop or think too much about characters, at least the way I do my thing. I, I usually put, put them in a predicament or a situation, and then I, I don't really watch them because I think that's also a cliche. You know, I watch my characters do what they do. Um, but I also feel like, um, so the, they, they, there's, a, there's an element for me of, of sort of thinking, um, not thinking about character when I write stories. Right. And just like my mantra was always just like, well, one of my mantras is you're only as good as your last story. That puts a lot of pressure, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pressure. But also, like, um, what is my other mantra? Um, <laughs> you're only it's as good as your last mantra. No, it's like, uh, it's from some movie, like, I think it was Throw Mama from the Train, a really bad movie, or, or one of those movies where it was, uh, I forget the actor, and he was like, um, writer's right. Like, he was trying to get him. So sometimes I just say, okay, writer's right. Like, just m make something fucking happen and just keep going. <laughs> um, but don't you think that, like, you're... The, the wonderful story that you just wrote from, like all the accrual of sense and action, and it's almost like on a mystical level you get a sense of this dog's character. Like there's almost like a mystical quality to her, that she's almost like a being beyond herself. Of course she's just a little dog, but she also means so much to these people and she's healed them both. So she's almost like a holy character in a funny way. She was, it was such a relief. I, I really, literally, when I was working on this story, was so happy to not have to write about humans. It, was like, <laughs> and it felt like such a joy to just yeah. not have to think. And I also it was all olfactory, olfactory. I just like just go through the nose. And sometimes I'm um, telling my students to pay attention to your nose. Like old smells are not. We don't use like I think I'm lying, but we don't use like 50% of our nose capacity. And so, like, I tell them to practice smelling. Like, go down the cinder block hallway at the library or whatever and learn, like, really pay attention to, to um, smells. So that, pay, that helped me write the story because I just went with um, olfactory stuff. Sometimes in the heat in New York, it's, it's yeah, painful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just to finish, just as an answer to, to my brief answer, I mean, I feel like the kids that I r wrote about, particularly in the Chekhovians, Lara, was probably the close, the, she has this natural way of ta thinking about God that's very musy, like she just drifts in and out of these thoughts, mm -hmm. which are very natural to her, and I think children do have those thoughts and yeah. perhaps we build walls around ourselves of busyness and practicality that make us less prone because we spend less time lolling about and like dreaming but I think that it's a natural thing to do for any human but particularly I think children yeah with the more unstructured time so you're you can just go there naturally yeah it's like you drift in you know into the metaphysical really simply and easily which the stories do, which I think was, you know, makes them feel like they can be funny, but then suddenly, as you know, Sadiq, you said, they take you to this place, and you're like, do I pray in planes? Do I not? You know, <laughs> you start asking those questions. And Sadiq, I, I absolutely loved your story, The Young Entrepreneurs of Miss Bristol's Front Porch, which you said was one of the first ones yeah, from this yeah. book that you wrote. And I loved the metaphor you had of, you described porches as being like quicksand. And um, you said the longer you was out in them, the more people saw you dying, which is such a devastating uh, moment in the story. And, and, but Miss Bristol's Porch is different. It sort of sub subverts this notion of fatal quicksand. Um, and the story does such a beautiful job of revealing what sets this porch apart. So this is sort of for all of you. If you could just tell a little bit about a story and how you came up with, you know, for you, the idea of Miss Bristol and conveying what makes it special um, that wouldn't necessarily be apparent to someone, but becomes apparent to the reader. 
which I think sort of brings them into the story because you sort of make something legible to them that wouldn't be otherwise. You know, it becomes like the intimacy of the story. Um, and then, and then for, for each of you as well, if there was a story where there was something that maybe would register as ordinary to somebody else, but within the world, the story, story becomes extraordinary, you know, in some way. Yeah, the, um, the young entrepreneur story, um, which is a story about a group of girls who decide to sell candy on the front porch. Um, it came from um, two things I was fascinated by. One uh, was the idea of the, the Southern punishment. And what I mean by that is like, I'm a public school teacher and um, you know, I, I teach mostly students of, of color. And one thing that I find like was a weird, funny theme was um, for those students who had family down south or in the Caribbean or in Africa, they were always threatened by like, if you act up in the city, we're sending you down south or we're sending you back home. Um, so that always fascinated me. And I wanted to write a story about a girl who got sent back. She was punished because she did something in school. Um, but instead of letting the punishment define her, she turns it into uh, a business opportunity. <laughs> and that's the second thing I was fascinated by because I think when I was about seven or eight, um, I grew up in, in Boston, in the inner city of Boston. And you know, I don't remember too much about my childhood, but I do remember two days in the summer, this girl named Toya came to my front porch and started selling candy. And she would buy it from the corner store, and then she would sell it for like three times the price <laughs> if you were still buying it. Um, she, even, she sold fruit, too. It, it, and you know, kids were buying fruit, like, um, and, and, and pictures of Bart Simpson. And it was, it, was, <laughs> it was a memorable, very memorable two days um, um, on that porch. And so just kind of combining those two ideas, I kind of thought about, like, um, you, you know, what happens during the summer when a group of girls want something so bad, but they don't, they don't get it. Um, and just to have um, the, the idea of uh, um, Miss Bristol, who's the grandmother, you don't really see her. But I kind of weirdly imagined, is it the, was it the Muppet? Was the cartoon where it was like the lady in the nursery, you could only see her legs? Of, um, the car Muppet Babies. Yeah, the Muppet Babies. Yeah, I, I imagined her like that. So you don't really see Miss Bristol, but you know she's there. It's all about the, the girls there. Um, but those two things fascinated me. Yeah. yeah. Marking up the fruit and the candy. Yeah, yeah. Good business instincts. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. I got so lost in that that I don't remember what I was talking about. What do we have? What's the question? The question was just about something that maybe, you know, if it wasn't in the context of the story, it would seem kind of ordinary. But okay. then within the story becomes kind of extraordinary. Like, um, yeah. Well, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is the picture. Um, there's a picture that Olivia brings, like a beautiful cut glass picked picture that this woman uh, brings to her daughter's trying to sell this cake that she made on the roadside in this rickety table at the end of their driveway. Uh, and she brings, she decides to use this pitcher full of lemon and makes lemonade. And she brings this exquisite pic pitcher. And they're kind of very downwardly mobile family that came from money that's been dribbling off for years. And she puts the pitcher on the table and this girl who's recently acquired this whole brand new body and doesn't know how to use it, like she doesn't know where she begins or ends anymore, she stands up, knocks over the whole table, the pitcher falls down and the cake goes rolling down the hill that's stuck on the plate and the girl goes to get it and the, and the woman just berates herself for having used it so casually. I find it very moving because I feel like I always do stuff like that. Like I, I shouldn't have done, you know, I, I just wasn't thinking and, and something just means something later after it's destroyed and like all the little shards are, you know, stubbornly beautifying the driveway and now it's like lost. And so anyway, that, 
That's what made me, that's what I thought. But they still consider eating the cake, which does. They did still yeah. eat the cake. I, that actually happened to me, I have to say. I was, <laughs> I, I had a roadside stand. The cake, uh, my friend parked his bike. The bike fell over. The, the whole thing fell over. Not, no picture though. And the, and the cake went rolling down the hill and it didn't fall off. The, the, it just stuck. <laughs> and, then, and then it fell down. And then it landed on its plate. Like, all it has is a little china, and we just took the china off. We still sold it. So entrepreneur, girl entrepreneurs, once again. And you can even say magical miracle cake, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was Made delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, David, I, I, I started. Um, yeah, uh, well, yeah, I'm having a hard time thinking of, um, I, I think I wrote a story, Two Nurses Smoking, the title story, and um, that that came from living near a hospital and walking every day, walking by the hospital for years and seeing the same nurses outside smoking. And as a former sometime smoker myself, uh, I keyed into that. Um, but in the story, um, and I, I became kind of obsessed with scrubs. Nurse, <laughs> like it was almost like a fetish or something. But, um, <laughs> People in scrubs. Anytime I would see somebody in scrubs, I would be like, you know, um, I don't know what I did. But, but so when I was writing the story, I, there was also a, it's a cut rate second tier hospital um, that is now taken over from by um, Monte Fiore, but it's still a horrible hospital near my house, and it has a smokestack like a super tall, little thin smokestack. And every time I'm walking, I look at the smokestack and I'm like, um, what the fuck is coming out of that thing? It's spewing this. And so in the story, there's a moment when I um, look at the, smokes, at the smokestack and say something like, um, coming out of the stack was the um, burned bandages and afterbirths and oh. placenta, whatever was burning. And um, so I guess that doesn't answer the question, but it's, it's sort of like, um, Somehow that image, to me, I was very happy with that image. And I felt like, OK, um, later, looking at the story and revising it, I'm like, wow, like, I don't know where that, how I got that in there that way. But it seems now like to stand as a symbol in the middle of the story mm -hmm. of all the aspirations and hopes that these two um, isolated nurses who meet each other and sort of fall in love some aspect of their inner life um, or maybe the bad stuff being purged outward into the sky. Um, so I, I, and I, I always sort of um, talk to my students and say, you know, symbols, because they, they come from high school and they're like, symbol, like what's the symbol? Like what's the bond? And I'm like, fuck symbols. Yeah. And at this point, we're just not gonna deal with symbols because the author did not sit and go, I'm gonna oh, put yeah. a fence yeah right here yeah, yeah. for the reader. Um, but I did feel good about this, there being a symbol in the middle of that story. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to imagine some class yeah. discussing yep. whatever. <laughs> there's the nurses smoking, there's a smoke. Exactly. <laughs> you got a, a mirror image in there. Um, so David, this is sort of, I'll question this and then we'll open up to questions from everyone who came today. Um, in your story, Vows, it ends with the question, in an average life lived by a relatively average soul, what else remains but singular moments of astonishingly, astonishingly framed light? Um, such a, a beautiful sentence, but so like out of a poem in a way. Um, so I think for, for the three of you, because these stories all have a luminous quality to them, was how does that idea of sort of framing light or like, you know, luminous observations or moments for characters relate or not to sort of how you know how to move your way through a story or like what to cut away and what to keep? Um, and how often, you know, when you're making different stories, do singular moments or that sort of moment of framed feeling or framed light um, somehow sort of open and give way to a new story and somehow and so way? Hmm. Well, I would say that actually, it's, I find that light is very important to me in terms of telling stories. I tell stories mm -hmm. with light a lot. I, I use light because for me, it's very emotional. Um, how I feel it completely changes when the light changes. And I think 
people are, that human beings are somehow essentially connected to light. And so, yeah, I mean, like, the, the, there's a story, it took me, like, so long to try to describe a woman walking across her childhood living room, like, through, you know, how to describe these yellow squares of light with the blue, the blue, the, you know, the blue casing shadows and like how to describe that took such a long time. It was so important to me to get that. And I think that that's a really, you know, so just that light is so important, such an important part of being alive. I think people can be like plants. We kind of lean towards the light, you know, and then that character finds the smudge on the couch. So yeah. there's like this thing we do with like the clean light and then like the dirty spot it's on the couch. terrible so I, can, I can see why you would say that. <laughs> Did he come up to you? Yeah. Um, yeah, the concept of, of light, you know, I kind of think of it as uh, just a stand in for uh, a person or a character that has had some kind of revelation. Um, and, um, you know, I think of uh, one of, you know, this is my very first collection of, of short stories. And my mom, who I didn't really think that was that into books, she was like, um, she she like found a, a, a essay that I, I wrote in sixth grade. You know how mothers are. <laughs> this is an essay that you wrote in sixth grade. You were destined to do this. And um, and it was like about it was about courage. I had to write about courage. And I remember I, f I forgot about the essay, but as soon as she showed me, I remember the thought process that I had writing it so many years ago. And I remember being filled with such just terror, like, oh my God, my life is not courageous, you know, like nothing. And um, I just thought, I was just, I was like, all right, you know what? I'm just gonna write something about something that happened that week. And then just kind of make up the courage that I had. Um, and so, um, the thing that I ended up writing about was um, it was winter time in my neighborhood, and I was walking home from school. And in December, in my neighborhood, they just kind of like on the park trees, they put up you know decorations, lights on the trees. And two of my fr uh, friends from the neighborhood, they had like a stick, and they were like trying to knock the decorations off. And they, they were like, do you want to, you want to, do you want to like join in? And, uh, and I was just like, I think in real life, I was just like, um, I just kept walking, but like I played it up in that say, like, I said, no, it was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> 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 and so I just think, of, you know, just the, that, that line of like ordinary people and you, you, you have like this brief moment of light. Um, and I knew in these stories, I was choosing the right, about high-rise building, about the projects, um, and that, you know, I try to resist every urge to be like, there was major drug trafficking in this story, three people got murdered. Like, I really wanted to focus on, um, you know, maybe people who don't make the headlines and the small moments of, of, of light, of, of revelation, so, um, um, when you when you read that line, I was like, "Wow, that is <laughs> that like." And you talk about like uh, not intending a symbol, but you know when you just write organically, like stuff like that comes out. So well, uh, when I read that yeah. line, it did feel like it applied <laughs> to your stories because I think you know there is a moment where light gives way mm -hmm. for the characters unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. Not it's like, oh, here comes the light moment, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I think that. Um, People who don't make the headlines is a good definition of the short story. Mm, <laughs> mm, you know, mm. it's uh, I, 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 that line comes at the end of a story that kind of covers a lot of a wide span of time, and uh, the the narrator I think it's in the first person that story I can't remember but that's the narrator is sort of he's alone his wife has died, and he's um, now kind of in isolation. But I one of the images that came from real life was. Geneve and I were walking back from a museum, and it was that Stonehenge, th that Sunhenge, or whatever they call it, where the sun was coming down the street. And um, that image of just um, 
seeing the sun on a Manhattan Canyon type mm. deal was the image that um, that I that I think I was writing towards when I was working on that story. Um, I guess they do a renewal of vows in that. Yes. Yeah. I, w I became kind of obsessed with that idea too, of like, um, not that I would ever renew my vows, but just the idea of people having to do that. And, um, yeah. And it's hard to think about. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to articulate uh, that how, how you, but I do think the story form is inherently about that glimpse and finding that yeah. light. Mm -hmm. um, like in your story, the o Okie Doke, which is an amazing story. Yeah. There's kind of a moment of light at the at the end after he runs back and then he, before he eats the food that he's ordered. There's like mm -hmm. a, a quiet moment right there. Um, that only, I, I, real, I, I think only the short story form can catch that. Also, often people are alone, right? And these sad things, moments, I think there's something fascinating also in film and, and, in, and in short story, like where you capture a person alone somehow, you know, that that's, they are, those windows open up often more. Yeah. Well, th I, I, I came up with these while reading your stories on very long international flights. So I was alone, you know, or with a hundred other people. But I mean, <laughs> and the way you're alone on a plane where it's just like a long time, you know. Um, so I probably if I had come up with them, you know, in a normal place. But I was like, what are we doing with spirituality and light? You know, in that way that like I do think those moments happen when yeah. you are, you know, even alone with others and in some way. Um, and I'm sure all of you have questions you want to ask as well. Um, somebody has a microphone, yes, that can pass somebody around. Somebody does. So if you have any questions, you can raise your hand and Darcy will come over to you with the microphone. And to our friends on Zoom, you can put your questions in, or on YouTube, sorry, you can put your questions in the YouTube chat. I really appreciate your presentations tremendously. Um, I write memoir. I write nonfiction. I mean, I don't publish, but I do write it a lot. And I've always made a big distinction between fiction and nonfiction. And listening to you today, I realize that perhaps this distinction I've been making is too sharp. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about drawing from your own life experiences. Now, Sadiq, it seems almost that he starts from them, as I understood it. But maybe you could talk about that some more and, and, and how you feel comfortable doing that. Because I really believed that fiction, you had to make it up. I'm kind of naive, but that's what I believed, that you had to make it up. I mean, I know that Faulkner and those people draw, drew from their experience, but somehow I, I discounted that. So if you could talk just a little bit more about this incorporating of your own experiences into the story, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, um, I feel like, um, you know, talking about, um, you know, affirmations and, and mantras, another mantra or just a phrase that just always pops in my head um, when writing is it's insider, outsider, insider, outsider. And I think back, um, to when I was growing up, um, you know, I'm the child of immigrants. My parents are from West Africa. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, being born here, I, was, I grew up very American, but then also had the privilege of having strong culture in the home. And I remember um, one time a friend came over to visit and, you know, we had like a mask. It was like a mask decoration. And we just giving the tour. It's a very small place. And um, I just passed by the mask. And as I passed by, um, this friend just took the mask off the wall and looked at it and was like, hmm, and then put it back. And it wasn't, it wasn't disrespectful or anything, but it, it, was, it was like, I, I remember looking like, I didn't even know that was there, you know, <laughs> like, and that, and like, I think about that, like, when I think about insider, outsider, 
It's like, as an insider, you have lots of insight, you know, because I'm in my own space, I'm in my own house. But then as an outsider, you can come in to a space and notice something that an insider would just overlook. Um, and so I think about that when I'm, I'm writing stories. I'm writing a lot about people who I grew up with, um, people who are my neighbors, people who are my family members or composites of family members. And in a lot of ways, um, their, their stories are like, like autobiographical, but then in other ways, I'm the outsider projecting myself into the characters. So um, I think it's, um, you know, when we talk about black and white, I feel like, and I tell my, um, I'm, pub I'm a public school teacher, and I always tell my students, um, it's not, the answer's not black or white, it's always gray. It's just what shade, what shade of gray. And so when we talk about um, nonfiction and fiction, and to what extent you should put yourself into it, with what extent you should make it up, I think you should, um, I definitely have both, and I really kind of think of um, both. Um, when I was writing the stories, I tried to um, have people that, again, that I knew who were composites, but um, I told myself that I wouldn't write a strictly autobiographical um, story, so much so that I can just honestly say none of the characters are me, but I do make cameos in my, <laughs> in my story. So like, again, I always say um, in the Okie Doke, which is about these, uh, these young men who decide to um, rob a Chinese food delivery man by ordering the food and then like paying with like Monopoly money or like, like fake bills. Um, and so one of the friends is like, before they do, do it, one of the friends is just bragging about somebody they robbed. Um, they were like, yeah, the other day I robbed this guy for like $9 and an iPod. And I always tell people, that, well, that person was me, you know, because that happened, that was, um, you know, based on something that happened to me. So I always inject myself in the stories, but um, they're never like strictly autobiographical. I, I th I'm just thinking, uh, the question of memoir and fiction. Um, I, I sort of think that there's a issue with, in, in general, with people um, not completely understanding the magnitude and the capacity of the imagination to make stuff up. Um, and so a lot of people will come up, I mean, and, and sort of project onto, onto me um, something, you know, of, that 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 I must have had uh, an affair, or, or I must have had get, renewed my vows, or whatever. Because they, the people, it's really hard for people to understand just the hugeness of the imagination. And so, um, though, there, and I think um, that that makes that's just one of the complexities of of the difference between memoir and. Uh, fiction, and, and like you said, that's the gray, there's a gray zone between the two, because when you're writing a memoir, you're obviously fictionalizing a lot, and you should. You can't remember what your mom was wearing when you were six, okay? You gotta make it up, you know, yeah, yeah. just make it up. Um, but, I do, but, I, but I think there's a kind of a complexity, and I think it also has to do with the idea of authenticity, because I think we're totally hung up on what's authentic and what's not. Um, you know, we live in the age of replication, mass replication, starting with the industrial age, and it and it makes it it caused this complete um, obsession with authenticity. What's the real chair? Um, you know, what's the real thing? Um, right. Yeah. I, I, I. But also that, I think it's also that everything gets boiled down to gossip. Like people just want to. It's like if, if they want to know if you had an affair because then, then it just takes all the artistry away and then it's just like, did you have an affair versus... And the thing is, though, but I also think it's... 
for me, it's like a strange cocktail. I mean, and it's it's really impossible to redo the recipe. Like you finish it, and you can't like say, oh yeah, you know, my aunt Tilly is this half of this and that, and this is like the picture. Oh yeah, it's that thing I saw, because we're living in the world. Like that's we only have the world and observations and our own selves, and it's a constant. It's a constant churning, but I think for a writer between their inner self their observation, their projection, their imagination, and what they've overheard. I mean, or heard or observed. And it's like this, it's, it's like, you know, there, there is no beginning and end to it. Like, it just keeps happening. And, you know, I, I remember Jeanette Winterston in a, I think it was a preface to the Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, said, is this book autobiographical? People always asked her, and, she, and her answer is, always, is Absolutely, and not at all. And that's the answer. Well, orange is not the only person. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That has to be fiction. <laughs> right. Hello, wonderful evening. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I think you, I know Rebecca and David, you've been commissioned to write articles. I don't, I don't know about you, but I'm wondering um, how you feel about that? Because it's—I mean, I've—I've I've really enjoyed the things that I've read of your two that have been commissioned, like your uh, the Granta Murat Saad um, oh, yeah. dead interviews. Directed them in London, actually. And um, but I—I I, I would just—I would just feel it was a lot of pressure if somebody asked me to like, do this, this many words. Like, is it—is it freeing? Is it, can it be freeing? How is it to be? commissioned? If it's enough money, it can be very pleasant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like commission away. Yes. <laughs> the money part's really fun. I do find it terrifying, though. Like, I find that, that very frightening. Because, like, I write into the void. I write, I don't know where I'm going. Like, I have no idea. You know, and so it's very difficult when somebody says, and now you're going to write about this, it's going to be an interview with somebody who's dead or whatever it is. I find it, but I also then enjoy it. It's, it's like, yeah, I guess I do enjoy it. And it is amazing, you know, to have that be a job that someone offers you. Yeah. Have you been I there? mean, I haven't been um, commissioned to write um, anything except, for, I think, like a, a Lit Hub um, essay, which was. You know, I was very flattered to, um, you know, be asked to, to write that. Um, but it filled me with terror because, you know, I'm, I'm in the void, too. I'm like, I'm just going to take my time until it's done. Um, but when you're given a deadline, you know, you don't have that luxury. Um, and I feel like... Um, I don't know, the way I would describe myself as a, a writer is sometimes I look at writers, and I have no idea what their process is like, but I'm like, are they a hunter or are they a fisher? And I feel like some writers are like hunters, where it's like they get at the desk and it's like, thousand words right now, I'm coming for you. <laughs> get, get. And, and, then, um, and then they're like, I think I'm a fisher, and I feel like there's some people who are like, uh-oh, I'm going to... You know, go on Amazon real quick and oh wait, <laughs> wait an idea, an idea. <laughs> you know, like and so I'm a, and so that idea of just like you have two weeks to do this, to it fills me yeah. with terror. And um, the only thing that like it's like a a vague pro to it is that you know they yank it from my hands and I I can tell myself well I would have worked on it more, but you know, but. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, the whole thing is interesting. Um, here's one question from um, Elijah, who's watching on YouTube. How do you figure out how long a short story should be? Do you experiment with different lengths for one piece? Do you have any general rules of thumb that you follow when deciding? No, I... I, I the, it absolutely just has to be as long as it, or short as it needs to be. Um, and that, that sounds like a cop-out, but there's just no way that you're gonna, 
mm. say I should write a 20 page story or I should add more pages to make it keep going or, uh, and a lot of the time, um, shorter is, a lot of the time it's something's way too long that needs to be shorter and it's just, you can't, you can't go by page count. <laughs> yeah. It, you know. I would, I, I, one thing I think is like, occasionally I've written something, I think I'm writing a short story, and I think, is this actually a, a novella or something? That has happened to me with Total, the title story of this collection. I was like, for a minute, I thought, oh, maybe. But then I thought, you know, the thing about a short story is that they're so wonderfully irresponsible as a, as a medium. You know, novels, you really have to you have to bring, bring in the whole thing home. You can't just like stop in the middle of a sentence or something. People would be very <laughs> pissed off, you know, after reading 200 pages. But, but, but like a short story is so anarchic by nature, you know? So, mm -hmm. so I think that with that story, I, I didn't want to over explain it. I thought if I over explained it or, you know, that it would kill it. But so, but some things are, yeah, but I agree. Some things are just shorter, some things are longer. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, some things are shorter, some things are, are longer, and it just takes you where you want, want to go. I feel like um, one vague, annoying piece of advice that some, I think it was some crazy, brilliant writer who, like, I, I, I want to say it was like Barry Hanna or something, um, but he was just like, just make it interesting. And so it's like, <laughs> such vague, <laughs> like, it's just such annoying, irritating, like, um, and, um, but, you know, obviously it's hard for me to follow that, but when I think of, like, the stories that I love, um, and I, I saw it with both, uh, both your collections, um, where there, the, the, the story just starts with something interesting, like, you know, deletion prompts, you know, like, writers, and you're, as a writer, you're like, oh, wow, yeah, you've definitely encountered prompts before, and then just to have the prompt itself be a story and then different prompts, and then it emerges into a story, that's just interesting, you know? Um, or like the, 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 the trauma where the, 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 the couple's meeting and they're in the trauma group, and then you're explaining like um, what, um, you know, the, the, how people lost their children, and um, it just it develops into a, a story. So it's just like a, a, a make it interesting, you know? Think of the title story where it's like, the, there's the, the sister, but she's like a creature, and it's like the same, there's, there's like a realism aspect, but then it's surreal at the same time. Um, but whenever I counter advice, like length, and I hear something like, oh, just make it interesting. It's, it's irritating, but it, it makes me think about other stories and what makes them interesting. Well, who said mm. that? Who was the writer? Somebody said that you just have to, the main thing is you just have to get people to want to turn the page. Yeah. It's the same mm. thing. Mm. Mm. Do you have time for maybe mm. one, one last question? Uh, we have one more from uh, YouTube which is uh, for Rebecca and others. As Rebecca has a story entitled The Chekhovians, who are the, mas who are the masters for all of you, um, from whom you take inspiration, guidance, instructions on craft. And a follow-up from Hope is yes, who are your mentors? In, what, what was the follow-up? Who are your mentors, I think? Oh, yeah. who mentors. my mentor is? Yeah. yeah. Or centaurs, I think it was mentors. <laughs> 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 Um, I think every writer has a centaur. <laughs> um, yeah, so actually one of my great, like, yes, Chekhov would be a big hero for me. Um, I feel like he gets it right, like the comedy, the tragedy, it's all in there. Um, you know, I, I've been reading, I just read this book by John Cheever, uh, called um, the Wapshot Chronicle, which I don't know anyone. Who, have you guys read this? It is just, is it not a great book? It's so good, and people are. I recommend it to everybody. It's a hilarious comic novel that I, I, you know, I just. It's so weird. It's such a strange novel. Um, yeah, so I love novels that are both sad and funny. I think that that's. I really love that, and and I feel like those two 
writers have that. There's so many other writers that I adore. Um, Flannery O'Connor is a huge, a huge hero. Um, and I could go on and on. Personally, uh, like a mentor, gosh, I'm not sure. Um, I, th I think my parents were kind of mentors to me. In a weird way, I'm saying that. I cannot believe I'm saying that. <laughs> but in a way, they were, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Uh, Sabine Hoffman, who's sitting right here, she's my <laughs> friend and my mentor. I don't know. People that I respect, I have a lot of people who are kind of mentors. It's a really hard question to, because check off, um, and it, for me it's always changing, like um, Catherine Mansfield has written some stories that just kind of tear me apart right now. And I was just thinking about John Edgar Wideman, who I kind of feel like is neglected as a story writer. And, and some of his little, uh, I forget what he called them, little micro burst stories. Hmm. Um, and like Weidman, when I first started write, writing short stories, I tried, I like tried to get him to, to I, I went, I was up at UMass Amherst visiting another friend and I, it's one of those things, I tried to like get him to meet me for a coffee or something. I think I was like 28. Um, so there's a, like a lot of, it, there's just a lot of writers that are, I feel like are mentors um, that kind of come into your life and, and help you along, you know? Um, Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, there are um, lots of um, short stories, short story writers that I um, admire. Um, I think the one mentor I had who I studied with at NYU was um, Lori Moore. And Lori Moore, if you're watching a recording of this, <laughs> you know, um, she really, um, like the clearest definition of a mentor, um, just I think um, when you think as a, and I'm educated myself, and I before I had class with her, I thought like a uh, creative writing teacher sees something that's absolutely phenomenal, and then says you got to publish this. But it's for me, it was like she saw like a potential in it. You know, because what she saw in the class was not what it ended up being, and I had to do a lot of work to, to get it into publishable form. Um, and you know, I go back to that whole, the whole idea of um, um, vague, annoying advice, and um, she definitely gave me some vague, annoying advice. I feel like the best the best mentors give you that vague, annoying advice, and and her vague, annoying advice for me was. Trust your instincts. <laughs> and like I remember being like slightly irritated, like, I don't know how to do this. But it was right, you know, uh, she was right. And um, you know, um, Kathy Belden, who's my editor, she's she's in the audience. Um, you know, again, she did she helped me a lot with um just the structure and just making sure I got it factually right. Um but again, the greatest vague advice. Um, and I remember when I was just like, oh, I'm stressed out about this, and I've been working on this for so long, and it's just, oh, I'm just tired. And she was like, if you need to take a break, take a break. <laughs> <laughs> and it was vague advice, but it would work. Uh, so I, when I think of mentors, I think, you know, they always give that, like, you yeah. know, expect them to give them a complex answer, but they give you the answer that you need. I feel like our, my editor, Jonathan Glass, is also mm -hmm. like a mm -hmm. king of vague, annoying mm -hmm. advice, and yet it's really <laughs> great advice. It's like, he's, it's like, it's a kind of sage, sort of like, yeah. you know, maybe we should see this person, this character three more times. This was for a, in a novel that was very complicated. In order to make, have, see this guy three more times, it took me almost an entire year to figure out how to do this. And, but it was just this, you know, this, I had a um, 
when I had an early novel that I ended up scrapping, and the writer who read it put at the end, you should be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really vague and annoying, but I actually have to admit, I have put it on, on other students, and I was like, that's one of those vague, annoying things that actually you remember, because I still remember it. And I was like, so maybe this novel won't make it, but I'm going to be optimistic about the next one. <laughs> 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 <That's funny. laughs> like, I do think sometimes the, the vagueness means that you can train transfer the advice to something else. It know? also means that they're not trying to tell you how to write. They're, they're not trying to needle, niggle it in there. You know, they're, they're not trying to be bossy. Yeah. They're trying to allow you space. I think yeah. that's what it is. I was just recently at Delphi, the actual Delphi and the oracles gave really vague advice. One, because then I think no one would like murder them if the advice was wrong. You know, so if Alexander the Great came in, you don't want to give specific advice. You know, and I think he apparently like dragged one of the oracles out of the cave and was like annoyed by the vague <laughs> advice. But they also think that might have been a trance or were chewing some sort of hallucinogenic leaves. But in addition to that, <laughs> there I think the vague advice was that you can then figure out it's on your own yeah. its intrinsic meaning. Yeah. So if it's vague, then you get to take away a break from the story or a break from that page, you know, like optimistic about lunch, you know, or about the, the novel, yeah. you know, like there's For a way. 45 you can... minutes you can take. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I, I think like when it's vague enough, then then what it, it's like, it sort of implicates you to bring a more specific right, right. interpretation. You have to like apply. Your... Can yeah. I just add one thing? Yeah. I, I really forgot to mention my real mentor because um, I don't talk about it a lot, but it, it's really Jonathan Franzen. We've been friends for years. And I was just thinking, I don't really talk about him because we're really, we're very close, but we're completely different kinds of people. Um, I feel like the public kind of knows who Jonathan is publicly, but he's always read everything I've written for years. And he's always the one that like, I'll send a story to first. And I know when I'm gonna get with him. It'll, he's a very loving person and he's, he's very giving when it comes to reading first drafts, but I will get something like, well, I don't know. It, it'd be very intense, negative. Sometimes I take it and just say, fuck you, and I, I, <laughs> I, I send it out anyway, but to have one person like that, yeah. um, and I don't even really think about it, but to have one person who has always been there for, for me. And is willing to be very honest. Very honest, you know, he's Important. way too honest <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't mince his words, um, yeah, you know. Yeah, you know that kind of thing. Um, but uh, he's been the most, like, supportive mentor slash friend in terms of keeping me alive with saying, you know, just, just keep going, write another one. It's okay if you're just a story writer as long as you don't have to compete with me. No, he doesn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he does, he did get, he has always given me this, this pep talk when I really need it. Um, so I just had to mention him. It just, I, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, okay, he really is the person who's given me the most. Um, and you need one person like that in your life. And, and my wife too, she, she's, you need one person though to say, okay, Keep going. Or two. Or two. <laughs> more, more is better. <laughs> more is better. Um, well, thank you all so much for coming tonight, and thank you for your brilliant books. <laughs>I tell you what to do about the signing line. We have an event tomorrow that's celebrating the work of Randall Keenan, who we lost uh, a couple years ago or last year. Um, and four actors are going to be reading from his um, nonfiction work. And I'd love to invite you all to come back tomorrow evening if you can. Um, so uh, to go to the bookstore, go out the back door and buy the books and then come back in here and uh, the line will go through here and I'll bring them over there to the table so they can personalize your books and give you personal advice one-to-one -one about writing short stories. Thank you so much for coming, everybody.